Okay, we're back live here in Silicon Valley, California, Brocade's Technology and Analyst Day. This is SiliconAngle.tv, SiliconAngle TV, The Cube, our flagship the program. We go out to the events is here. and talk to the and brightest minds we could find, entrepreneurs, CEOs, executives, anyone who's got the signal from the noise. We want to extract that and share that with you. We have Nagi Halim, who's here with IBM, IBM Research Fellow since 1980, going way back in the old uh, Tom Watson generation, early in IBM now. Obviously, IBM's been transformed. I'm joined with my co-host Stu Miniman from Wikibon.org, top analyst in the networking space, um, providing the best real-time market research. Uh, Nignagi, so tell us about uh, your current experiences with IBM right now, because IBM is really leading the charge right now on, on many fronts. Certainly the IBM transformation over the past two decades has been interesting to watch. Certainly amazing turnaround story, and then growth. And then now you got huge um, press props, industry props for the work we're seeing with the Watson computer, a lot of big data, a lot of social commerce, a lot of really great stuff going on, cloud obviously within IBM, but in particular the big data uh, effort has been pretty smashing success for IBM. So um, give us an update of kind of what's going on right now, at IBM in your world around big data, we've got social, mobile, and cloud kind of exploding onto the scene, changing the, the tech landscape, certainly under the hood, powering the iPhone 5, bring your own device to work, consumerization of IT, all this stuff's happening, and literally under the hood is a complete re-architecture. Uh, I think so that's, that pretty accurately captures what's happening. Uh, I would say that uh, to make headway though in a topic like this, uh, you need to have a conceptual model of what's going on, right? So what I like to do is to think about uh, big data, not from the data perspective, but rather from the perspective of what it is people are creating. So people are creating very complex systems. They're creating uh, immensely complicated uh, telco networks, um, transportation networks, uh, and in fact, these uh, systems that we create out of people to do social interaction are a different kind of system. Right? So many, many complex systems. And when you put a system like that together, uh, the objective is to accomplish some larger purpose, to deliver some good or service, to do foreign exchange, to do capital markets, so, so some purpose that you have. And those purposes are always uh, very important, sometimes absolutely critical, and, and when those systems operate, what's really happening is that they throw off a lot of data, and that data can now be used to understand what the system is doing. So that's the perspective that I've kind of developed on this. So you have both man-made systems, you have people themselves that are complicated entities, right? Human beings are very complex themselves. So uh, we're talking about medical kinds of applications, but then also natural systems. In a way, the right. schema of IT is changing to uh, all kinds of different schema, and that brings up the whole notion of, the, we're in a connected world, right? So, you know, you, as you said, this construct is uh, IT and infrastructure providing all kinds of packets moving around, but now you got a consumer that's connected to the network with a device and that's providing data. And so, the advent of NoSQL databases, virtualization, provides a new paradigm for developers. And obviously with solid state, you now have an unlimited memory. Right. <laughs> so, so, this canvas that's going on right now from a creativity standpoint is pretty amazing. So share with your insights around what you're seeing around this, this new transformation to this modern era where everything's changing, programmability, um, with things like just addressable memory. And spinning disk is going away to solid state, database technology is changing. Again, so it's, just, it's amazing to kind of, it's hard right, to really so, get your arms around. Right, so, so all the things that you're talking about though, uh, still are about creating capability and facilities to make life better, right? So uh, if it's dissemination of information to individuals through uh, personal devices, or if, if it's in a hospital setting where you're monitoring patients very closely, or if it's uh, you know, sort of mapping or any of these other things, these are systems that provide some kind of product, some kind of benefit for individuals, right? And now those systems are being built out of all these new technology things that you're talking about, right? You build them out of solid state instead of disk, you build them out of high-speed networks instead of old clumsy networks, et cetera. But it's all to advance the provision of services to people, right? We're providing better healthcare, we're providing better communication, we're providing yeah. better social awareness. So we're building things to do that. And so of course, I'm very familiar with and work with all of the underlying technologies. But from a big data perspective, what I'm really focused on is each of the different industries that's building systems has some important question they want to ask or answer, have answered. So if I'm building a network, I want to know how that network's being used. So would it be safe to say that one of the benefits of big data is, um, two benefits, the main benefits of big data is one, answering existing questions faster, 
right. and two, answering questions you never could answer before. That's right. Is that, would that be? So, so, so I would say faster, but also more accurately and more automatically, right? So as the systems get more complex that we're building, they have more scope, they do more things, they're more automated, and there's also the risk that those systems won't do exactly what you want because they're difficult to control. People are good at building the systems in the first place. Once they're built, you don't necessarily know exactly what's going on under the covers because things are happening so quickly and on such a scale. And so big data now can provide instrumentation, essentially. Think about it this way. A new kind of instrument for looking into your systems and figuring out where the inefficiencies are, where the fraud might be taking place, where the system is not operating as designed, where some emergent behavior may be coming out. So for example, where the system may be deciding too much traffic is going through one place, so maybe it's too uh, uh, much of a single point of failure. Many okay. things can happen, right? So, and each different, in what's fascinating about it for me is that each different industry uh, has different kinds of questions. If you're uh, an agriculturalist, you may want to know how your seed is going to perform. If you're a transportation guy, you may know what, where your pinch point is in a communication, in a transport network, right? <laughs> so if you're uh, distributing electrical power, you may want to know where you have power theft or loss of power or where you have uh, equipment that may be failing because it's overused. Right? You know, I love that term, instrumentation, because you know, you think about it, it's like a network management problem. You know, I want to instrument my packets on the network. But in reality, life with big data, as you mentioned, is one where you need a lot of policy, another network concept. But in a way, the networks we're living in are distributed networks. <laughs> right, so every, uh, every piece of data, whether it's a human being involved, is a distributed network. So in a way, network principles apply now to the data. So, Oh, they do, absolutely. So how do we enable this environment where dynamic policy, because essentially what you're saying is every industry, you can't project syntax onto one industry because it's different to another. And so you have to have some flexibility and agileness around you know, systems. I got to be adaptive, and I got to be able to be flexible so that one industry can ask one question, and be just as powerful as the next industry, which has a completely different semantic question. Right, they absolutely do. And so what's really needed, first of all, is for us to explore uh, very closely with partnerships uh, what that particular industry is all about. And so we have an interesting specialization in modern society where you have specialists in a field, guys who know all about oil exploration, guys who know all about medicine, guys who know all about networks, right? But they may not understand analytics. They may not understand how to exploit uh, the data that's thrown off by analytic systems. And yet IBM cannot have expertise in every single domain, so we need to closely partner with domain experts to understand the things that you're talking and about. And also technology uh, you guys are developing around machine learning is, and is right. really cool. So I want to ask you a question along the lines of how you get intelligent systems to be more intelligent. So an, an, an area that I've been thinking about for quite some time, um, because we're in the, 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 uh, the content business, uh, which is essentially internet infrastructure at this point, uh, is this notion of meta-reasoning. Okay. So reasoning is an AI type concept. When you've got things now in the, uh, in the industry like machine learning and AI is kind of Absolutely. becoming very practical. So can you share just the IBM insight around what's going on around on some of the research around, I don't want to say classic AI, more like reasoning, like meta-reasoning is like making sense of, of, of keywords and interaction data. I mean, essentially that's what we're kind of talking about here, ontologies. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you're raising that because um, I think there's a big focus on the underlying technologies, you know, the NoSQL and et cetera. And uh, really the way to think about the solutions for these problems is they require these very advanced platforms, essentially kind of the operating system that runs the applications. Then there's the application layer. And that application is not only composed of things along the lines of what you're talking about, machine, la uh, machine learning modules, or uh, reasoning modules, or uh, classification modules, et cetera. There's very advanced analytics. But there's also an application structure that has to be created. So it's not just the, app the uh, analytic kernels. It may also be the combination of those kernels into end-to-end -end applications that are very smart and very flexible and adaptive. And some of this requires um, technology that's actually quite advanced for example, planning technology can understand a little bit about the problem you're solving and potentially reconfigure the applications to better address or attack that problem. What's some of the cutting edge work? How, where are we in this? Because that's really kind of, I'm seeing that as an important part of kind of these future apps, especially as things have to be retrofitted for mobile and different kind of environments uh, versus the full on big bloated application module in the past. Right. So what, 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 where are we? Are we in the bottom of the first inning? Is it, can you give us some sort of benchmark in your opinion? Like, I mean, are we in the middle innings? Are we like, well, you know? Let me give you sort of a, of, a, of a sliding answer in the sense that, you know, we're pretty good at solving the problems that people want to sort of take on right now, okay? And, but, but the point would be that there are problems way beyond the ambition of people that uh, we can't yet solve, 
Okay, so what I'm saying is there's kind of a progression or a ladder from yeah. where the problems are today that are practical. So today, for example, we may want to look at transaction fraud in uh, financial services. We can do a pretty good job with that. But maybe we're not ready yet to do facial recognition in an airport. That may be beyond what we're able to do, or real-time speech analysis, right? Where are we with computing? Uh, we were just at Intel Developer Forum yesterday, uh, getting kind of down and dirty in some of the weeds around some of the tech yeah. around, sure. uh, obviously compute, storage, networking, all this stuff's going on, and uh, silicon's being advanced. So it's not just silicon anymore, it's solutions, right? So you're seeing more integration, Intel moving from an element to now more solution specific. Right. Computing and virtual machines give us more capability. Where are we with that in your opinion of, uh, in terms of uh, advancement? And we've got a lot more work to do. I mean, with things like crunching numbers and simulations now we're, we're doing stuff in the cloud. Where, where are we relative to the, to the progression um, in that? In I feel that we still have a, a ways to go in terms of making significant breakthroughs and getting away from the fairly classic von Neumann programming model. Uh, a lot of it's handcrafted work, right? And so we're starting to investigate things for the automation of multi-core exploitation, uh, things of that sort. And we're also looking at uh, reprogrammable logic to uh, improve application performance. So lots of things there. But I would say that we've hit some, uh, I would say stall points, and I'm still looking for some breakthroughs to happen. So Stu is giving me the, I got to get a question, Stu, I'm sorry for ignoring <laughs> you. Um. It's, all, it's all right, John. I, I know big data is one, one of your passions here. Uh, so so two questions. Okay. One is, you know, we're, we're here at Brocade. Right. And I was wondering, uh, I was reading about some of your, uh, it's the Infosphere streams. Right, um, right. If you could talk about yeah. the, the Brocade relationship, and then the second piece uh, is, you know, you're in research, and right. IBM's done quite a lot of a acquisitions in the big data space. Matter of fact, uh, Wikibon's based in Marlboro. Right. Natiza's right around the corner from sure. us. Nice. Uh, nice folks, you work with Natiza, you work with Cognos. You know, if you could talk a little bit about what you see inside of kind of the research versus, versus the M&A and how those interact. So, two okay. very different topics, yeah, yeah, but right, I was wondering right. if you could, you know, <laughs> before so we went out of time. Was, which? Uh, Brocade and okay. Infosphere right. and so, how you guys uh, partner together. Okay. So, um, that one's pretty simple. So Infosphere Streams is all about this live data acquisition and processing uh, platform. And we're talking about extremely high speed uh, analytics that can take in you know, millions of messages per second and actually do on the fly analysis for anything from financial markets trading to uh, cybersecurity applications to uh, quality of service investigations on large networks. So very broad range of things that we're able to do that. So we partnered with Brocade because Brocade has the very well known MLXC device which is a telemetry device that sits on a telecommunication network and provides some uh, first level handling of the data. So think of it as creating a sensor that sits on the network that allows streams behind that device to process the data for higher level analytics. Okay, okay so that's a very nice partnership. And uh, furthermore, we can actually uh, uh, diagnose situations in streams with very elaborate uh, applications and analytics and then give feedback to the device. So the MLXC can actually look at different parts of the network depending on what we're seeing. Okay. Okay. And, and then the second piece is kind of organic research versus M&A. Right. Well, the research division is a very, very significant uh, body. Not only do we have the headquarters location in New York, but we have labs around the world. In Brazil, in uh, Dublin, in China, in Israel, et cetera, but there are only so many topics you can actually work on, right? You have a finite population, and as we've discussed here, the problems that we have are very wide ranging in terms of all the things you can do. Uh, so we have a set of projects, but then we supplement uh, our activities there with uh, targeted uh, acquisitions that fill in gaps in certain areas. Okay. Very simple and, and statement. Do you find, do, do those groups then move into research? Are there folks that are joining your well, team? Typically or? when we do an acquisition, we uh, earmark some funds for them to work with research. So the research division then has a shot at partnering with that new acquisition to uh, enhance or elaborate their technology, broaden it out, pull it into other activities, et cetera. One of the advantages of having been at research a long time for me is that I know a lot of people throughout the division what the projects are that uh, might bear on a particular acquisition. So it's a very interesting time with acquisitions coming in. Great. Okay, we are here live inside theCUBE. Live coverage at Brocade's Tech Day. I'm John Furrier here. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break and uh, we'll bring you all the action from all the innovation here at Brocade. Thanks for watching, we'll be right back. <laughs>